A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, amen, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have not asked anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. I have told you this in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but I will tell you clearly about the Father. On that day you will ask in my name, and I do not tell you that I will ask the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have come to believe that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. The Gospel of the Lord. So, I have to begin this novena by making an admission, maybe a confession, that I didn't really know anything about St. Peregrine before being invited to come and preach to you this week. Well, let me be even more honest. I knew nothing about him whatsoever. So I had to find out. And he turns out to have had a very interesting story. So his life seemed to be going in one direction when that direction completely changed. And so often in our own lives we think that we are going on one particular path. Then something occurs or there's a chance meeting and our life changes. So Peregrine was born in northern Italy in about 1265 and his city Forlì was at the center of volatile political conflict between the papacy and its opponents in the Italian cities. So in a sense the church was divided. So the Pope, in order to kind of achieve some kind of reconciliation, sent the prior general of the Servite friars, later known as St. Philip Benizi, to try and make peace. Well, Peregrine was not on the Pope's side, and he was a hot-headed, volatile young man of 18. And sometimes, as you know, young people think that problems can be solved very easily. So he chose the way of violence. So when St. Philip began to speak, Peregrine assaulted him and beat him up so that St. Philip had to leave the town, bruised. Then he was overcome with regret and he went to ask Philip's forgiveness. And it was this meeting that changed the direction of his life. And what was it that St. Philip said? What was it then? What was the message he communicated to him? It wasn't that he said anything. Peregrine said, he simply smiled at me with a great gentleness. And that touched Peregrine's heart. And his life changed. It was because he had been willingly forgiven. The experience then of forgiveness. Now, some years later, a little while later, Peregrine actually joined the Servite order, the same order as St. Philip. And when you think about it, isn't that a strange way to get a vocation? You get a vocation by beating up a saint. It's very unusual. I don't recommend it, by the way. (laughs) So, Peregrine then became known for his compassion and his wisdom as a spiritual counselor. But one day, he noticed that there was some kind of swelling or sore on his leg, which turned out to be cancerous. And the doctor suggested that it needed to be amputated. No real sophisticated medical treatments in those days. So the night before the operation was due, Philip was praying before an image of Christ crucified, and he fell into a kind of sleep or a trance, and he dreamt or experienced that that Christ came down from the cross and touched his leg. The next day, the cancerous sore had disappeared. And he went on to live until he was 85, another 30 years. Which in those days was unusual. The average lifespan was about 40 years. So he lived twice as long as most people. And as a consequence of this, he became the patron of cancer sufferers. So that's the story of Peregrine, part of it. Well, why do we have shrines like that of St. Peregrine in Forli? It's still... Actually, an object of devotion by many people who go to pray at his shrine. Shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes. What, what, what purpose do these have? 
people sometimes ask, well, you know, build big hospitals, you know, do medical research. What are you having these places for where people just go and steep themselves in superstition and disappointed hopes? Hmm? Well, when I was a chaplain in the University of Oxford and later at the University of Cambridge, I used to spend a week during the summer vacation with a group of students, large group of students, who weren't offered a week of vacation to serve with the sick in Lourdes, the sick pilgrims. Hmm? And many of them went on to promise to come back every year for a week. Some of them do now, even though that their parents and their children are growing. Every, every year they give a week. Why give a week of your vacation to something like this? Well, in Lourdes, for example, the sick take a central role. They're placed first at every celebration. They are the most important people. They're treated with respect, with care, and with kindness. And their witness to their faith from the midst of suffering is a form of preaching to the rest of us who think we are whole. What does it preach? It preaches the virtue of hope. Especially given that if the world had its way, all of these people would not exist. Hmm? As why? Well, living a diminished quality of life, consuming ever scarcer health resources, demanding an undue share of overburdened healthcare services. So what's the central image of our advertisers while they're trying to persuade us to buy their products or invest in their retirement facilities? Well, we're confronted with young, heavily buffed, bronzed young people all having fun drinking non-alcoholic cocktails, because eh? that's, of course, much more virtuous, hmm? although less satisfying. Hmm? All the people then who have appeared to have drunk deeply from the fountain of youth, or else in the case of retirement communities, have you seen any of these re retirement communities? Very expensive, advertised on the TV. Hmm? And what do they present us with? What images? Well, it's groups of agile over 80s exercising on the parallel bars in a luxurious environment of golf courses and swimming pools. So our shrines and pilgrimage are centers for all. The sick and those suffering from some form of handicap are not to be tidied away lest they embarrass the rest of us or make demands on us that we don't feel we can respond to. They're not tidied away to be cared for exclusively by professionals, but are to be venerated and cherished by all. Why is that? Because we are all on the same journey. We all form one body. We're an Easter people serving and worshipping the God of the living. Now the name Peregrine comes from the Latin word Peregrinus. Now, it can mean a stranger, a person who doesn't belong, or as it later developed, it was the word for pilgrim. And in the scriptures, in the letter to the Hebrews, the first letter of Peter, they take up this idea. They remind us all that we do not quite belong to where we are, and that we have to resist the temptation to settle down and go native in our world. Resist the temptation to assimilate to its standards and its values. We're all on a journey. The early Irish monks lived this experience to the full in the earliest days of Christianity in Ireland. For them, there were various forms of martyrdom. There was the red martyrdom, which was the martyrdom of blood, which we celebrate today, Justin Martyr's martyrdom, which meant shedding your blood for Christ. But there was another one called the white martyrdom. And what was that? It was exile, exile from your home. They went then, sometimes they knew not where they went, like Abraham, to preach the gospel wherever the seas or the winds blew them. So it meant separation from kith and kin, from culture and home, from language, and that's a form of martyrdom. Well, of course, to be a martyr is to be a witness. So what are we witnessing to? Well, they were witnessing to the self-giving sacrifice of Christ in which the martyr shares. As we pray in the creed, he descended from heaven. Though his state was divine, he humbled himself in a glorious abandonment of self-giving love and came from his far country to be with us and for our salvation. It was a form of exile. He came to dwell amongst us. Why? For our healing. What does salvation mean? It means healing. 
Now, there are various understandings of separation and voyaging as a share in the passion of Christ. Well, one form, the Greek form, meant that it just meant separation from your native land or your country. But the Latin version meant that you journeyed for a reason, for a purpose. It wasn't aimless wandering. It wasn't a form of nomadism. It was for a reason. It's to travel to a distant land for a purpose. And it's that destination which will give your life meaning. So our lives, the meaning of our lives are unfolded not from their beginnings, but from their end, from their purpose. Now the pilgrimages of our Christian lives of discipleship are precisely that. We don't simply leave our homes. We depart in order to go somewhere else. And we do not know where the destination is. But the end of the journey is implicit in every step we take. It's not simply ahead of us. It's present with us now in every step we take. Now the world in which we live is obviously not the kingdom. There's something lacking. And that consciousness of something lacking is what fuels our desire for something brighter and better. This is not all there is. The only way to be true to what we have been promised is by living in accordance with that promise. Not settling down. In his second letter, St. Peter says, By holy living hasten the coming of the day of God. The destination is implicit in every step we take. By holy living, facing the challenges that confront us every day, the challenges to be good. And what does our faithfulness consist in? Not great dramatic acts, but being faithful in the smallest things. When we suffer for the sake of the hope that is in us, we live holy lives. It's not those who can inflict the most who triumph, but those who endure the most. So the existence of sickness is a sign of all that. A sign that the kingdom has not yet come to the rest of us. Hmm? All of us at some point will endure some, some form of sickness, especially perhaps as our lives become more frail and weak as they continue. Hmm? The kingdom has not yet come. So sickness or infirmity is a sign that we're still on the way. We're still in a far country, journeying towards our true home, when the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped, when the lame man shall leap as the heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing for joy, when we shall no longer be oppressed by our bodily infirmity. When Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, that way is for everyone. It's not just for the healthy. It's not for the whole. It's not for the entire and the integrated. Some people think that that's what the church is for. It's for those kind of people. But as we know, the church was founded for sinners and it has been full of them ever since. It has been extremely successful in appealing to its market. It's this community, in this community, we all have something to offer to the well-being or health of the whole body. What's the well-being of the health of the whole body? It's virtue. It's goodness. Jesus, in his ministry, has a knack of bringing what the contemporaries wish to hide or ignore to light. The weak, the deprived, those suffering some forms of handicap or disability were included in this way and made into living words of fidelity and hope. God always had a prejudice in favor of the weak and the fragile ones of the earth. And often he chose them to shame the apparently strong, as we pray in the preface for martyrs. You choose the weak and make them strong in bearing witness to you. They have a purpose, not simply just to be victims or objects, but to be a bear witness, made strong in bearing witness to him. What would be the point of choosing the strong? Since it would be assumed that their witness stemmed from their own merits, and not from the grace of God in Christ. So the Christian way is a Catholic way, a way that is available for all. It's a journey for which you don't need a ticket. It's a project, the coming of the kingdom, in which we will all share in our different ways. Jesus of Nazareth chose to identify himself precisely with those who were heavenly burdened, And in doing so, he renewed their dignity, restored their humanity, and bestowed on them a mission to further his work 
in the world. And in their response to him, they were conformed more closely to his image and became icons of courage and endurance. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. After Mass, we shall be offering the sacrament of the anointing of the sick.